Good morning. A warm welcome to all of St. Paul's family and friends out there, and to all those who are visiting us this morning. As we sit together as families, or perhaps even on our own in front of our TV sets and computers, we need to realize that we are not alone. Indeed, over the last month, we have had an average of 199 viewers on YouTube each Sunday. We know from chatting to family and friends that they come from all parts of the country and some even from overseas. So as we meet together, we trust that God will meet with you and that you will experience the warmth of St. Paul's family. This is the ninth Sunday of lockdown and this morning we have a very special service. A treat for everyone, especially the children, as we are having all age worship. In a moment, Hannah will be ministering to us as we look forward to receiving what she has prepared. This is the first Sunday of the, after Ascension. You will remember that just before Jesus ascended to the Father, He instructed the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in this coming week, we will be preparing ourselves for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lavishes us with gifts, and these are given to us to bring us to spiritual maturity. Our call to worship this morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now God's presence is with people, and He will live with them, and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them, and will be their God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together this morning as your people, apart but together in spirit. We worship you and we adore you. We worship you as the creator of the universe. We see the vastness of space, all of your making, the galaxies, the stars you have put in place, and we are amazed that you keep us in mind. Our earth is but a speck in the universe, and we are like dust on the earth. But you care for each one of us, and know each one of us by name. We therefore kneel down and praise your wonderful name. Lord, as we come into your presence, we say thank you for all that you have done for us. But we know that we do not always say thank you in the way we live our lives. We are sorry as we remember the wrong things we have done the things we should not have said, and the ways we have hurt people. Most wonderful and loving God, forgive us for everything that is wrong in our lives. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to live as Jesus lived, so that we may say thank you for your gifts in everything we say and do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm now going to hand over to Hannah for the children's address. Welcome to our very first jam service here on St. Paul's YouTube channel. I'm so excited that we get to do this today and have um, a normal or what used to be our normal um, morning services together on a Sunday. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to have a really fun um, worship session with one of our most favorite songs, Jesus, You're My Superhero. So feel free to jump up and down and get all involved in those actions that um, our teachers have put together for you. And then we're going to have a devotion, a little lesson. And we are learning today about spiritual maturity, which means how we grow in our relationship with Christ. And last but not least, Auntie Julie has planned a fantastic craft for you guys to do at home. So um, on the WhatsApp group, and we will send it on the church group as well, you will find all the things that you need that your parents can print for you or you can draw and make yourself at home. And don't forget to send it to us so we can see all the beautiful craft and art you guys have done at home. Um, so before we begin, I'd like us all to close our eyes and bow our heads and then we can open up our church service with a prayer. 
Dear Father God, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you that we can all come to you today, Lord, and learn about you and just grow in our relationship with you. Lord, I pray for all the children that are at home and that are listening to this, Lord, that we will be preparing our hearts for you, Lord, but that we will also be just having a wonderful time with our parents on Sunday and just have a wonderful time learning about you. I thank you for your great love for us and how dearly you love us and how you have made us each unique. And I pray that this will be a service that will bless all our hearts. And I pray Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Right, guys, are you ready? Get ready for the music. Okay, see you now. lesson is going to be on spiritual maturity. Now we can learn a lot about spiritual maturity by looking at a normal house plant. Now spiritual maturity is how we grow, how what we do to learn and to grow to be more Christ-like. So before anything can happen what do we need to start off with to have a plant? We need a seed. Now we can be the gardener or the planter that plants the seed into the soil because we can all plant God's word and God's love into the lives of other people. We serve God when we tell people about Jesus' love, when we tell people about the good news of Jesus and how he came to save us from our sins, how his great love and how he died for us on the cross. So we can plant that seed, but only God can make sure it grows. So every time you speak that little word of love and of God and of God's great love, you are planting that seed into other people's lives. Now, the first seed that happened in you was when your parents spoke to you about um, Jesus, about Jesus' love for you, about how you were made in his image. That planted a seed in your heart. And they had to then pray and have faith that God would one day make sure that that seed would grow in you, 
that you would then look for more knowledge, that you would then look towards God, that you would look to build a relationship with God. And that's how it all started, your faith and my faith and all our faith. It all started with that little seed that got planted in your heart because of somebody's word, because of somebody's kind deed, because of your parents reading to you at night Bible stories. That planted the seed in your heart. And that's exactly what happened with our flower here. We planted a seed and we hoped and we prayed that it would grow. We thought maybe it didn't. Some days it looked like a seed would never ever pop out. But we had faith that our seed would begin to grow as you can see here. Now, what happens once I've planted the seed? I can't watch it and sit there and be like, oh, grow, grow, grow. No, I can water it and I can pray and I can make sure it's in sunlight because plants need sunlight. But I have to have faith that that little seed knows what to do, that that seed that God created knows to grow. Now, as a seed, it first begins to grow what? It grows roots, and those roots grow deeper, 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 down into the ground where it can get all the water, all the nutrients from the soil that it needs. And that's the same thing with us. As we are learning about Jesus and learning about his love, coming to Sunday school, doing church on YouTube like this, our roots are growing deeper and deeper and deeper. And that soil, our soil, is God, is God's word, is the Bible. So every time we read the Bible, every time we believe in his promises, our roots grow deeper and deeper and deeper into the soil that is God. And so our faith grows, so our maturity grows in God. Our next thing now is now these roots, they grow, they grow deeper and deeper and they are consistently being nurtured and getting water and nutrients from the soil. And these roots, as they grow deeper and deeper and deeper, they get stronger and stronger and that eventually they are so strong and so sturdy in the soil that if a great big wind had to come and blow it down, it wouldn't be blown down. It would stay very firm in its foundation. And that's exactly what happens. Every time we read our Bible, every time we pray, come to church, um, have our time with God in the mornings or evenings, whenever, when we have that quiet time with God, our faith and our spiritual maturity grows deeper and deeper. So that when things like a pandemic, when fears or anxiety or the coronavirus come at us, we are so sturdy and firm in God's word and in God's love for us that we know nothing will harm us. We become a plant like this. A plant that is now grown, beautiful and big with all its leaves and that is set and sturdy in its soil. If I have to blow, nothing happens. It doesn't fall over. Negativity and everything will not let this plant blow over because it is strong and rooted in its soil. And that's exactly what happens with us. Our faith grows and we no longer have to fear. We might have fear, but we know what do we do first. When we have a moment where we are doubting or anxious or fearful, what do we do? We stop and we pray. And we ask God, please help us. Lord, be with me. Lord, help me here where I need your help. And that grows our spiritual maturity because we are not trusting and having faith in our own ability. We are trusting and having faith in God. Having faith that his promises are real, that when he says, I will look after you, he really will look after you. When he says, I will take care of you, we know he really will take care of us. And that's the exact same thing with a plant. This seed got planted, and if we didn't water it, if we didn't nurture it, then it would never have grown. But because we did, it did grow, and it grew bigger and bigger and bigger until one day it might look like this, with all its leaves pointing up to God, praising God. And that's exactly what happens. So a plant needs, like we said, it needs water, it needs sunlight, it needs soil. And that's the same thing for us. We need the Bible, Jesus, his love and praying. We need those things to grow our spiritual maturity. We need the church to help us grow. We need Jam and Sunday School to help us grow our spiritual maturity because each of those things helps that little seed that is in your heart to grow and grow and grow bigger. 
So we are now going to do a really fun craft that Auntie Julie has prepared for us that is going to just help you remember this lesson that we've learned. It is a craft about how our plant is in a pot plant and how our roots grow deeper, deeper, deeper. Okay, And on each of the petals, you are going to write something there that is about how God loves you, how God looks after you, and what we need to do to grow our spiritual maturity. So you can write things on the petals such as, um, you know, pray or read your Bible. All the things that your plant needs that you need to grow. Morning, children. Today we are going to be making our own pot plants to grow in God's love. Cut and colour your pot plant. Templates will be sent out on the WhatsApp group. Stick your pot plant together. Write down ways to grow in God's love on your flower petals. You can make your own or use the ones that come with the template. Feel free to use anything around the house to decorate your pot plant. Enjoy. So I really hope you all have a wonderful Sunday and I hope you all enjoy the next sermon part which will be done by Ivor and um, I can't wait until we are one day back together. See you next Sunday everybody. Bye. Morning everyone. So good to be with you this morning. Our first reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2, 12 to 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice of ser and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The second reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good day, St. Paul's Church and everyone tuning in from wherever you are. It is a privilege to be bringing God's word to you today. I trust that, that you will um, be blessed by this word. I trust that your life will be challenged and I trust that you will be filled with the eternal hope that Jesus is Lord of all, even in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this crisis, and in the midst of anxiety. Let us close our eyes and we'll open in a word of prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for this word. We give you thanks for this time that we are in. We give you thanks that you are the author and the perfecter of our faith, that you are the one guiding us and leading us and moving us forward. And as we engage with your word um, today, we pray that you would have it take root in our hearts and that we will uh, apply it to our lives and our stories, specifically as we face this crisis in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, church, my sermon today 
is on spiritual maturity in times of crisis. What I mean by that is that regardless of what we see and experience in our lives and in the world today, Christ is still calling his church, he's still calling the body, he's still calling his bride forward to respond and to love as he would want them to love, to respond to the crisis that we see around us in a way that reflect his heart and his desire and his calling for our lives. You see, just because we are in the same storm, it doesn't mean that we respond to the storm in the same way. Um, just because people that is does not love who does not live with a Christ-centered view and a Christ-centered perspective of reality, just because they respond with anxiety and fear and anger and racism, it doesn't mean the Christian voice should be of that same kind. And that is what I mean by spiritual maturity in a time of crisis. I have four things for us today. That I, that I relate out of the passages that we have read from Paul in how can we respond in a spiritually mature way to the crisis and the times that we are facing in our world today. The first thing that Paul says in, in Philippians 2 verse, verse 14 is the following. He says, do everything without complaining so that no one can criticize you. That alone is for me a difficult truth to swallow. It is a difficult truth to accept. To, to respond to this crisis in a spiritually mature way, Paul says, do everything without complaining, do everything without arguing, says the, 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 the NIV translation. And, and why should we do that? So that no one can criticize our witness in the world during this crisis how have you find yourself how have you find the condition of your heart maybe some of you have lost a job some of you were retrenched some of you had to take a salary cut some of you are seeing the some of the the decisions that are made in parliament and all you want to do is complain or you want to criticize and i'm not saying that we shouldn't be critical of some of the decisions that are made we we, we should um, hold government to account but the question and the challenge and the invitation for those who are spiritually mature is to 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 not complain and to not be overly critical so that it ends up hurting the testimony of Jesus hurting the testimony of the church I have seen a lot of people on social media Christians specifically who have started out during this lockdown very positive, very, very excited and praying for the government and saluting the government in making these swift decisions. But as the lockdown begins to take its toll on them, as their comfort is beginning to shrink, as their finances is beginning to shrink, they can't get cigarettes, they can't get alcohol, they can't drive where they want to, the worst attitudes come out. They started being overly critical. And these are people who have been Christians for quite some time. And Paul is challenging us, do, do everything without complaining so that people cannot criticize your stance and your position in, in Christ. People have lost perspectives. They are negative and, and complaining all the time but 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 the the, the the fact of the matter is that the church should be critical the church should um speak um be a prophetic voice but if all the church but if the church is mostly known for its complaining during this crisis we are giving the world a false picture of jesus and the hope that we claim to have during this time of 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 lockdown, Nadine has lost her job, and and we had we had two responses that we could have had as a as a as a family as a couple. 
we could have complained and said, yes, we, we now see that this is a mess and now everything is going to the dogs and it's just the worst. Or we could say, you know what? Christ is still calling us as a young couple here in Pretoria to respond with compassion, to respond with the hope, the eternal hope that this life is not all there is. The second thing that can help us become spiritually mature in times of crisis is to respond to life in a Christ-like manner. To respond to all of life in a manner that is worthy of the Jesus we call Lord and Savior. Paul says in, in verse 15, he says, he says, after he says, uh, do everything without complaining, he goes on to say, he says, live clean and innocent lives as children of God, shining bright like lights in a world full of cricket, crooked and perverse people. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Friends, a sign of having a mature understanding of the Christian faith is when a person consistently responds to life's circumstances in a way that is opposite to that of the crooked and perverse people. Imagine if the church also respond with crooked and perverse attitudes that is unlike that of the, the Jesus we call Lord. We are to respond to life, to all of life, not some of life's circumstances. Whether you are retrenched or not, whether you have to take a pay cut or not, whether the church is closed or not, to all of life, whether you can go visit your family or not, to respond to all of life's circumstances in a Christ-like matter. What would that look like in the coming weeks for you to say, I want to reflect a spiritually mature nature in this time of crisis. So what can I do practically? I must respond to whatever comes my way, whatever comes in my day, whatever comes in my week. I must respond to it in a manner that is worthy of this Lord that I call Jesus. And so more than ever, more than ever, it is a time in the world that is necessary for Christians to shine like bright lights. Our world is full of darkness. Our world is full of pain. Our world is full of brokenness. Our world is full of hurt. We see it amplified because of this crisis. And yet, and yet, as Paul sits in prison in Philippians, as Paul sits in prison writing this letter to the Philippian church, he says, Friends, I am suffering the worst experiences here, but I want you to respond to life in a Christ-like manner, in a clean and innocent way, shining like bright lights in this crooked and perverse world. There's an old story of a Dutch Anabaptist a martyr by the name of Dirk Willems. Willems. The story goes that he um, was captured when, when, uh, in the 16th century when, um, when the Netherlands was still under hectic, hectic um, Spanish rule. And so he, he uh, was captured and um, was thrown in prison. And one day he escaped from, from prison. And he ran over a, a, a frozen dam. And one of the guards chased after him. But, but, but the, the, the guard was a bit overweight and the, 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 the ice broke and the, and the guard fell through. And as he's crying out and, and crying for help, this guard, um, Dirk Willems looked back and he had a choice to make. Is this a situation in which I respond because of my comfort, my freedom, I want to go see my family? Or is this a situation in which I have to respond in a manner that is worthy of the Christ I call Lord? And we know, for those of you who know the story, we know how the story ends. He went back and he rescued this God, which obviously meant 
that he was captured again, that he was put in prison again, and that he was eventually burned to death because he responded in a way that is worthy of Christ. He responded to life in a Christ-like manner. And we are called as Christians that we should respond to life in a Christ-like manner. That is a sign of being spiritually mature in a time of crisis. We, we, we could argue that, that his own freedom, Derek Willems' own freedom, wasn't the highest priority of his life. In that moment, the highest priority of his life in that moment was to show a God, a, a crooked and perverse person. He, his, his highest priority was to show this person what Jesus is like, even if it means personal suffering, personal discomfort, personal sacrifice, and even being burned at the stake. Paul says in verse 17 of Philippians 2, he says the following, he says, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life. That is harsh words to hear for Christians. I will rejoice in Christ because my life is not about me. My life is about Christ. I will rejoice even if I lose my life because I'm pouring it out like a drink offering to God. And that is the whole point of maturing as a Christian. It is to ask more of Christ and less of myself. Friends, how are you responding to what is happening in the world right now? Is it Christ-like? Is it different from the world? Is it clean and innocent? Only you and I can stand by ourselves before the living God and say, I am responding to this crisis in a way that Jesus calls me to, or I respond to this crisis in a way that my fear, my anxiety, and my comfort is calling me to. We have the choice, like Dirk Willems had the choice to choose personal freedom or to choose a way to respond Christ-like. Thirdly, we become spiritually mature in, in times of crisis when we become people of earnest and urgent prayer. I want to say that again. We become spiritually mature in times of crisis when we become people of earnest an urgent prayer. And this is not one of the things that comes out of the text. This is something that I felt too important to leave out because during this crisis, the church is called to their knees to pray to God, to seek the face of God for the lost, for the hurt, for the broken, for the world leaders, for the people we do not like, for the decisions that they make that is uncomfortable to us. We are called to be people of earnest and urgent prayer. If the church aren't a people of prayer, it becomes a people of anxiety. I really need to stress that. If the church aren't a people of prayer, it becomes a people of anxiety. We will either be driven by our prayer towards Jesus or we'll be driven by our anxiety of what we see around us. If we don't call out to God to be present in our lives and stories in this crisis, we have no hope to offer an already anxious world. The, the Guardian is a, a UK uh, newspaper. They posted an article um, on the 3rd of May. You can go read it. They posted an article in which they said during this time of COVID-19, they said a quarter of all of the UK citizens, a quarter of all of the UK citizens have watched a sermon online. We thought the church would be in crisis because the church had to close its doors. But they're in a country that is almost seen as largely post-Christian, post-church. A quarter of its people have watched a sermon Online. It further says that one, and you can, you can go Google it, it further says that one in 20 people says that they have turned to prayer during this time of crisis. A country that is largely post-Christian, people say, we want to turn towards a power, 
in, 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 a, in, a, in a force, in a presence that is greater than us to this crisis. We must be a people of earnest prayer and of urgent prayer. And if that's how these, that's, if that's how people in the UK and, and people in a first world country are responding to this crisis, how much more do we need to turn to Jesus, to turn to the scriptures, to turn to each other as a community and as a body? A community that stands in solidarity that says, I feel your pain. You, you might not be a Christian, you might not be a, a, a follower of Jesus, but I feel your pain. I have empathy towards your pain because we are part of the human race. We stand in solidarity with those who are hurting, with those who are broken, because we are sharing this suffering. Let us become people of earnest and urgent prayer. My, my, on the 1st of May, we had a, a brilliant, brilliant uh, a youth network of over 500 people. We had a 24-hour prayer day on Zoom and we asked anyone, old and young, to tune in. But it was run by a youth group, a youth ministry. And, and it's, it's a testimony to if the youth, if the young people can over technology say we want to seek the face of God for what is happening in the world. How much more should we as mature believers, as adult Christians to say we will turn to prayer during this time of crisis? It was so interesting and so cool to see Daniel from St. Paul's Church and also Tanita from St. Paul's Church that was tuned in to that 24-hour prayer session. And I want to encourage you as a church, continue to seek the face of God in earnest and urgent prayer. And friends, this, in this crisis, in this, in this moment that has come to shape how we will look at the future, it is now of even more importance for Christians, for Christ followers to live and walk in prayer daily. There is no better remedy. There is no greater antidote for the anxiety, for the stress, for the chaos of this crisis than prayer. Tim Keller says it beautifully. He says, if you, he makes the example, he said, if you were to hear from your doctor tomorrow, that you will that you have a serious serious illness and if you don't take a pill at 11 30 at night every night for the rest of your life you will die he says will you will you will you even run the risk of skip one day he says will you will you won't you put reminders everywhere that you have to drink your pill won't you your life will will be centered around not forgetting to drink this pill because you might die he said that is prayer in time of crisis that is what creates spiritual maturity when we believe every day when i leave my house i cannot go into my day in this crisis without prayer Friends, lastly, for the spiritual maturity of the church in times of crisis, we must, we must embrace a theology of suffering. We must embrace a theology of suffering, that suffering is part of what the church is called to do. Throughout the ages, you can look in scripture, you can go look at church history, throughout the ages, when the church grew the most, when the church was the most effective, it was during times when the church was persecuted, when the church was suffering, when the church was hurting. We must learn to embrace a theology of suffering. The, the faith healing movement has given us half of the truth that God wants to heal you, but sometimes he doesn't. And that is part of the cross that we have to bear. The prosperity gospel has given us half the gospel. That God wants to bless you, but also when you don't, when you are poor, when you are hurting, when you sit with a life-threatening illness for the rest of your life and people have prayed for you and nothing has happened, that is also part of what God is calling us to. We must be able to, to grow spiritually mature in times of crisis. We must have a perspective that suffering 
is part of the Christian journey. You see, a lot of people, a lot of people want to go to heaven, but they don't want to die to get there, right? A lot of people want God to bless them, but they don't want to go through the trials and the tribulations and the challenges of life to get there. We want to naturally, supernaturally arrive at a place of great blessing, of healing, of everything is okay in our lives. But suffering is part of the story. Jesus didn't arrive at Sunday resurrection and at Ascension Day without having to go through Holy Week, without having to go through Monday, Thursday, without having to go through the cross of Friday, without having to go through the tomb of Saturday. The resurrection did not come without the cross. Suffering should be part of our theology. Paul brings this truth home in the other reading that we have read of Romans 8, which is such a powerful, powerful chapter. N.T. Wright, the, 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 the British uh, uh, New Testament scholar and theologian, he says um, uh, Romans 8 centers for him. It, it covers the entire gospel in one chapter. That is Romans 8. And at the end of Romans 8, Paul brings it home when he says, when he says does it mean that he no longer loves us? If we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. He said, no, 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 no. Paul says, despite all of the suffering that we endure, that we readily embrace, despite it all, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. And then he goes into that beautiful ending part when he says, I am absolutely convinced. I am convinced beyond a shadow of the doubt. I bet my life on it that nothing, not blessing, not curse, not suffering, not crisis, not COVID-19, not poverty, not economic collapse will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, God desires for you as a church to grow, for you and your family to live spiritually mature lives. But for that to happen, embrace suffering. Stop complaining. Respond to life in a Christ-like manner and become people of earnest and urgent prayer. May God's grace and his favor be upon you as a church. Let me pray and we'll end there. Jesus, thank you so much for your life. Thank you so much for your death. Thank you so much because of you. We can know that we, even in the worst circumstances, we can still take courage. We do not have to complain so that our testimony in the world will be heard. We can respond to life in a Christ-like manner. We can, uh, we can be people of urgent and earnest prayer. And above all, we can embrace a theology of suffering. Because nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ivor, for that challenging message. There are numerous scriptures that tell us if our faith is not growing, it is dead. So each of us must ask the Holy Spirit to assist us in examining ourselves to see if we are indeed growing in faith. What Iva had to say reminded me of a story of a little girl who fell out of bed. When her daddy went to pick her up, he put her back into bed and gently asked, what made you fall out of bed? To which she replied, I think I stayed too close to where I got in. Now that's what happens to many of us during times of trial when we fall away from the faith and we start doubting. It's often because we haven't matured and we have stayed too close to where we got in. Many of us have been faithfully depositing money into the church account and I thank you all for that. Some have been collecting the money and keeping it in their homes to bring to church once um, lockdown is over. 
But whatever we've been doing, I would like to say a prayer to dedicate our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So let us pray. Father, every good gift comes from you. You give generously without refusing anybody. May our gift assist in the preaching and spreading of the word, so that people near and far may be remade in your likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for Pentecost, our daily devotions will be around the topic of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We thank Beryl and his team for these daily devotions. They have been a blessing to so many of us. Please look out for these each morning. They are sent out on WhatsApp, but you can also see them on YouTube. Just search YouTube for St. Paul's United Church, Mar Barton. If you're not receiving these, please contact the office and they, we will make sure that you get them. If any of you are aware of someone in need, there are blue buckets at the church. Now, at St. Paul's blue buckets refers to food parcels. We have these at the church and you can pop in and pick them up for distribution. Just ask Gustav to assist you. If any of you wish to donate food to the needy, you can deposit money into the church account and put as your reference blue bucket. We will use this money to replenish the supply. Thank you to all who have assisted in the putting together of the service, especially to the technical folk for the time consuming task of editing and putting it together and then uploading it to YouTube. So in closing, I would like to close with a prayer compiled by Max Licardo. Let us pray. Abba, thank you for sending a helper to direct my steps. You know everything and will guide me in your will. Help me to know your will. Keep me on the path you have set for me. Give me the desire to stay true to that path and forgive me for the times I have already strayed from you. Be with my friends and family who are at a crossroads and don't know what to do next. May your spirit guide them and make the best decision clear. Thank you for caring about the details of my life, for not believing any requests. It's too small. I believe this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and say the benediction together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Have a good week as you enjoy the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.